Good evening. I will give you a brief university update, including three of my goals for this academic year. The first goal is to keep everyone safe, healthy, and engaged during these trying times. Fortunately, I've had a great team working with me each day on the university response to the COVID-19 pandemic. More than 100 staff and faculty are working nonstop to ensure the health and safety of our faculty, staff and students, as well as to fulfill the university's academic and research mission. All faculty, staff and students who come to campus are tested each week through our COVID-19 surveillance testing program. Through it all, our students, faculty and staff have demonstrated tremendous resilience. This is reflected in our COVID-19 screening results. In 2020, our positivity rate on campus was 1.5%. So far in 2021, the rate is 0.35%. We are also reaching out to our broader community. In early March, we partnered with Cleveland Health officials to distribute COVID-19 vaccines to Cleveland residents who meet Ohio's eligibility requirements. Over the last five weeks, we have administered nearly 5,400 vaccines, a combination of first and second doses at the Veal Convocation, Recreation, and Athletic Center. The credit for this extraordinary accomplishment belongs to the teams that coordinated the effort, as well as the dozens of enthusiastic volunteers who provided on-site assistance. While we cannot know for certain what the fall may bring, we are approaching the next academic year with a sense of possibility. We are planning for full occupancy of our residence halls, for the vast majority of classes to be in person, and for extracurricular activities and campus events to return in their fall 2019 formats. Of course, this will depend entirely on our ability to achieve them safely. As we have done throughout the pandemic, we will closely follow all COVID-19 developments. We will base every decision on the best available scientific information and expert guidance and update everyone throughout the spring and summer. The safety and wellness of our community is truly my top priority. My second goal is to pave the way for the university's incoming president, Dr. Eric Kaler. Eric will begin his role as the president of Case Western Reserve on July 1st. He joins us from the University of Minnesota, where he served as its 16th president from 2011 to 2019. An accomplished chemical engineer, Eric is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Inventors. In his role as president, he led the University of Minnesota to unprecedented growth in research, fundraising, and graduation rates. Eric Kaler is a driven and capable leader, and I'm as excited as everyone else is to see what he achieves at Case Western Reserve. My third goal is to continue to advance the university in all ways. We continue to advance our critical mission of educating and training the next generation of the world's leaders and scholars. Further advancing this mission in January, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine and Lieutenant Governor John Yousset announced plans for the Cleveland Innovation District. The Innovation District is a collaboration among healthcare, higher education, and business institutions, creating significant research development and job opportunities. Last year, representatives of Case Western Reserve, Cleveland Clinic, Cleveland State University, Metro Health Medical Center, and University Hospitals began meeting regarding Jobs Ohio's plan to locate the state's second urban innovation district in Cleveland. This development catalyzes the first major collaboration among Northeast Ohio's leading healthcare and higher education institutions. Over the next decade, our joint efforts are projected to contribute to 20,000 new jobs. 3 billion in research activity, and another 3 billion in economic impact. The goal? Make Northeast Ohio the nation's preeminent hub for healthcare and biomedical research. For our part, Case Western Reserve will concentrate on advancing our expertise in all areas that include, but are not limited to, artificial intelligence, big data, and drug development, with a particular emphasis on their implications for cancer, infectious diseases, neurological disorders, and cardiac issues. This strong collaboration among our five institutions bodes well for the future of the University, the City of Cleveland, and Northeast Ohio. Additionally, I have launched the Community Engagement and Impact Initiative, which will strengthen the University's community engagement activities and deepening its impact on the region, particularly in the areas of health and wellness, K-12 education, economic development, 
and addressing structural racism and racial disparities. I have also moved our Government and Community Relations Office to the Office of the President, demonstrating its increased priority at the University. Part of the Community Engagement and Impact Initiative is a Neighborhood Advisory Council, which will advise university leadership on relevant issues, programs, and projects that significantly impact people in East Cleveland and the Cleveland neighborhoods around campus. I'm delighted to join you for our third virtual faculty spotlight lecture. I hope you all remain healthy and safe. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our featured speakers. We have two accomplished faculty members and CWRU alumni, Professor Mark Chopp and Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway. Professor Chopp earned his PhD from Case Western Reserve in 2003 and joined the faculty in 2006 and is an assistant professor at the Jack, Joseph, and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, he chairs the concentration in community practice for social change in the Masters of Social Work program. Professor Chupp is also the founding director of the Community Innovation Network, a resource for communities and practitioners seeking strength-based approaches to community change. In 2020, he was named co-director of the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University. Professor Chupp began his career in restorative justice, eventually directing the first victim offender reconciliation program in the United States. He also served as a consultant with the National Institute of Justice, helping establish victim offender mediation programs across the country. His work over the past 25 years has focused on appreciative inquiry, community building, community development, and intergroup conflict transformation. Also joining him tonight is Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway, who earned her Juris Doctorate from Case Western Reserve University in 2004. Initially, she worked as an assistant prosecuting attorney at the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office before joining Tucker Ellis, where she practiced in the litigation department for six years. In 2012, Professor Hardaway returned to her alma mater, where she joined the faculty as an assistant professor of law at the Case Western Reserve University School of Law, teaching as a clinician in the Milton A. Kramer Law Clinic. She is also the director of the School of Law's Social Justice Law Center and the co-director of the university's Social Justice Institute. In addition to her teaching responsibilities, Professor Hardaway currently serves as deputy monitor of the independent monitoring team appointed to evaluate the progress and implementation of Cleveland Police Department reforms mandated by a settlement agreement between the city of Cleveland and the US Department of Justice. Tonight, our speakers will share more about Case Western Reserve's Social Justice Institute. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce these two alums and two prominent members of our community who truly embody the university's call to think beyond the possible, Professor Mark Chupp and Professor Aisha Bell Hardaway. They will be taking questions following their presentation. And if you have questions throughout the program tonight, you can submit those to, via email at faculty-spotlight at case.edu. And now I turn the program over to Professor Chupp and Professor, Hard Professor Hardaway. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Cowan, and thank you, Mr. Dickin, for um, that great introduction and everything that you all have done to make tonight a reality. Um, I don't want to spend, I won't spend a lot of time um, with talking this evening. Um, <clears throat> Mark was gracious enough to take the lion's share of the work on this project when I was unexpectedly going to be called away uh, for a media spot tonight. Uh, but that was canceled and I'm now here with you and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, you heard from Mr. Dickin, uh, all of the details of my background and sort of how I, how I became um, affiliated with the, with, the, with the law school as a faculty member. But I just wanted to take a second to explain sort of why social justice really matters to me and how it is that I came to um, become the co-director of SJI. Um, I will say uh, when as a young faculty member on campus focused on uh, my research areas is focused on um, understanding the legal inequities that are um, continually perpetuated by our laws and our systems and our legal processes. I write in areas uh, that highlight the marginalization 
uh, and the oppression of, of Black people specifically. Um, and that was sort of a lonely place or a lonely sort of academic lane for me to be in as a young scholar. Um, I recall being uh, at a, a conference that was actually a, 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 a people of color conference and being told very clearly that reparations didn't matter and no one under, and that the reviewer who was giving me feedback didn't really understand why I thought it was important to write in that area. Uh, fast forward just a matter of like two years uh, and reparations became a major topic after Ta-Nehisi's Coates um, a piece in the Atlantic. And then we know with last year's June or yeah, two years ago on Juneteenth, there was a congressional hearing around the topic of reparations. Who would have thought it? Um, I say all of that to say, I maintain my courage and my desire to stay focused on um, using my scholarship to lift up the issues uh, that concern me uh, and that I thought were important to help uh, raise the concerns of others simply because of the support that I received on campus, not just from my law school community, but specifically from the Social Justice Institute. Um, that community with all of the, the affiliated faculty members at the time were so welcoming uh, and gracious um, and, and, and the community members from not just affiliated on campus, but these amazing, brilliant thought leaders uh, from the greater Cleveland area would come to SJI events and we would have full thoughtful dialogues around the issues that concern the marginalized and the oppressed. Um, out of that work, uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching and writing in the area of low wage worker rights um, and, of course, police violence um, and reform efforts. And so I'm extremely grateful uh, personally uh, for the support that I got uh, from SJI under the, the direction of Dr. Rhonda Williams and then later Tim Black and John Flores. And so when uh, Provost Ben Benson um, made the offer for me to uh, become a co-director uh, with Dr. Chupp, it was something that I knew immediately I wanted to be a part of, not just because of the fact that uh, SJI was personally important to me, but because I knew that the Institute was uh, important to so many other people, both on campus and off campus. And I wanted to do what I could to make sure um, that it was properly stewarded uh, and supported. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you all. Mark has a full presentation uh, for which I will jump in and out of pieces and parts. And I'm just great, thankful that everyone is here. Mark. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, it is such a, a pleasure to work with you. And I'm, I'm humbled and grateful to be a partner with you on this important work. And you're so humble. Um, for our audience to know that uh, your ability to be here tonight is, is quite an accomplishment because you were on CNN at seven o'clock this morning and we're planning to be on Wolf Blitzer tonight. And so um, the fact that the plans changed and you're able to be here is, 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 is really great. And uh, we applaud you for the work you're doing um, in the Derek Chauvin case. And, and uh, we look forward to seeing you on Wolf Blitzer later, maybe this week. So. Let me uh, also thank President Cowan and uh, Eric and, and really um, Dr. Rhonda Y. Williams, Professors uh, Tim Black and um, John Flores for the great work they've, they've laid. So um, I wanna start by saying that our country is at a crossroads and it was important for me to be a part of this process of joining uh, SJI at this time because of the crossroads we are at. The extremism we see playing out today reflects the sense of desperation among those who see those of other races and cultures as a threat to their own white identity. I believe we have the opportunity to transform our country if we recognize this moment and commit to racial justice and radical inclusion. Facing our own complicity and taking an anti-racist position is not a zero sum game, but it's an opportunity for all of us to gain even as we create a more just and equitable society. The Social Justice Institute is working to transform our university and promote an approach to racial equity and racial justice that has relevance for today. So I'll start with my own background and then provide an analysis of the state of our country that includes three sources of our current social turmoil. I'll then turn to how the racial 
justice uprising has impacted our university and how we've responded. Aisha then will present the role of the Social Justice Institute and how we promote racial equity and racial justice in our work. To do this work, we all must reflect our own story. I grew up never imagining myself to be a university professor. Neither parent graduated high school. My dad worked long hours to keep food on the table for our family of nine. I was 10 or 11 years old when I went with my mom to Dollar Days at JCPenney to get my first new clothes. I still remember the crisp feel and fresh smell that were unlike any of the used clothes from Goodwill or those handed down from my older brothers. With a lot of conflict at home, I immersed myself in school. After attending nearly all white elementary and middle schools, I chose to go to a private high school to get away from some negative influences that I worried would take me down a path I did not want to go. My parents had learned from my older brothers that sending your kids to a church school can make a difference. In high school, my worldview began to change. I had black, black and Latino and Asian friends. I learned that peace and nonviolence had the power to change the world. I pursued college after a gap year living with indigenous families in Guatemala that changed my life. I came back and I studied history and peace and conflict studies at Goshen College, a small liberal arts school in Indiana, my home community. That put me on a path into a career, as you, as you heard, in restorative justice, community building, and community development and peace building. But that's not the whole story. For too many years, I thought my story was just that simple. I came from a place of struggle. My family worked hard and saved money. I dedicated myself to my studies and was rewarded for it. I took for granted many steps that were largely not available to those who were not white. My dad was able to get loans to start his own carpet business. We moved to the suburbs with a guaranteed federal mortgage primarily available only to whites. My parents drew on their increased income to pay for part of my college debts, the remaining portion coming from subsidized federal loans. Soon after graduating, I married and my wife and I bought our home with a federal FHA loan based on a very skimpy credit rating. The equity we built up created new opportunities. So fast forward to today, the history of systemic racism in this country has expanded the divide created by the opportunities afforded those who look like me and denied of those who are black, indigenous, or people of color. A variation of my story is told by white Americans across the country. It's part of the American dream. The problem is not that I had all those supports to get to where I am today. The problem is that millions of people due to nothing else than the color of their skin or their ethnic identity have consistently been denied this path. Let's look at how this has played out locally. I'll share some slides and we will look at how this plays out in the city of Cleveland with the history of redlining. Redlining in Cleveland created uh, a dimension in which uh, some people were benefited and public housing was created in the inner city and urban um, uh, dwellers were relegated to renting while those who lived in the suburbs were homeowners more uh, subsidized by federal supports. And that redlining continued to affect the last century and the wealth that was created and the disparities that were created actually have life and death consequences. If you look at this map, you can see that life expectancy is 23 years difference based on where you live. And so some of this data you've seen before, but I just want to point it out that the same data where people uh, ended up living because of redlining uh, created a black and brown communities in the suburb, in the inner city and urban areas and white suburbs. So despite the many barriers, fair housing laws that led to an increase in home ownership rates among some people of color throughout the last part of the 20th century, there, there has been some gains. But then the foreclosure crisis in 2007 disproportionately targeted again neighborhoods of color. And as a result, predatory lending and other deceitful practices have stripped away the gains made. 
So the difference in black and white ownership today is actually larger than the 27% uh, gap that existed in 1960 when housing discrimination was actually legal. According to the Urban Institute, from 2004 to 2007, nearly 8% of Black American and Latino families lost their homes due to foreclosure, compared to 4.5% of white families. And after the Great Recession, gentrification, and more recently, the pandemic, have only made things worse. Today, in cities with larger Black and brown populations, the homeownership gap is 20 to 25%. In Minneapolis, where George Floyd lived, there's a homeownership gap of 50% between white and black residents. So the killing of George Floyd lit a flame of outrage that had been waiting to happen. Since 2013, Black Lives Matter and the work of black scholarship has laid bare the wounds of systemic racism. Data in housing, education, health, income, and wealth all point to these increasing disparities that we see on this map, even during periods of low unemployment and economic growth. The lack of the taking of black bodies by police confirmed the structural racism is reinforced through force. The killing of George Floyd lit a flame that ignited the growing awareness among people of color and many white Americans that this injustice was much too much to bear any longer. So I believe we are facing a social reckoning, which is part of a much bigger pattern of injustice. Caging immigrant and refugee children from Central America and permanently separating them from their parents seemed unimaginable in this country, but it happened. And it was happening as a deliberate deterrent strategy. Blaming the coronavirus too on China with racist slurs fueled anti-Asian and Asian American hate resulting in over 3,200 acts of hate recorded by the group Stop Anti-AAPI Hate since the pandemic started alone. And the mass shooting of six women of Asian descent in Atlanta has led to massive protests and rallies of support for the Asian community across the country. So how did we get here? And what are the sources of this current turmoil? I wanna to turn to three sources that I believe are pivotal to this um, situation. White supremacy, an over-reliance on violence, and the legitimization of extremism. So what do we mean? Let's examine each of these. White supremacy is a racist ideology based on the belief that white people are superior in many ways to people of color and other races, and that therefore white people should be dominant. It's not just an attitude, but it extends to systems and institutions. Ibram Kendi, X. Kendi writes that white supremacy is code for anti-white and anti-human. Everyone loses in white supremacy. The common denominator of all this hate and is an ideology that has created a zero sum game that advances that where any advances by people of color is seen as a threat. Heather McGee in her recent book, The Sum of Us documents how throughout history, a false premise has pitted people of color against white working class families. When in reality, all of these groups have gained from programs and policies to lift people out of poverty. Rather than give up the dominant narrative of white supremacy, predominantly white communities close their swimming pools rather than allow them to be integrated everyone losing. The second source then is how we got to where we are today is the ongoing reliance on violence. This, re this reliance on violence is not new. Our country was founded on genocide. We forget the violence that has occurred. And this, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King said, almost 54 years ago to the day that the US was the largest purveyor of violence in the world. This fact has not changed. Violence is not just what's visible, but it what is structural underneath that as well. It's the events and then below the surface are the patterns, the underlying structures, the mental models that have created this con these conditions. 
Dr. Shamaria Arki, who facilitated our recent social justice teach-in, states that we have been seduced into forgetting. We forget the violence of the near genocide of over 150 million indigenous people of an advanced society that was here before Europeans came. We've not reckoned with the social and cultural and economic impact of 400 years of capturing and enslavement of Africans to build this country. We forget the concentration camps of over 120,000 Japanese Americans who were rounded up just for their appearance. And then Jim Crow laws and to the current school to mass incarceration pipeline all contributed to this. So this reliance on violence is at the core of how white supremacy is maintained in both foreign and domestic policy. The US dispends as much on the military as the next highest combined countries. In public policy, the status of quo is maintained through a state sanctioned violence through mass incarceration. And over the past decades, there has been a 500% increase in incarceration and a 239% increase in probation and parole. African Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at a rate that's five times the imprisonment of whites. And here in Ohio, it's even higher than the average. It's five and a half times. Research by former SGI co-director, Dr. Tim Black has found that debt in the form of fines and restitution and fees is integral to the criminal legal system as a form of labor subordination and social control. This new debt peonage keeps a poor disproportionately black population under the control of the state authorities and perpetuates a racially segmented labor segment. And as uh, co-director Hardaway research shows, policing is central to this state of force to maintain white supremacy as well. So this third source then is, of our current turmoil is the legitimization of extremism. In the last decade, violent extremism has been on the rise in this country. And unfortunately, it was relatively small and not taken seriously and allowed to build an infrastructure of support. With Donald Trump's election then, racist ideology and conspiracy theories found a foothold in mainstream media and public office. The constant disinformation from public officials and the social isolation created by the pandemic and the unregulated social media created a toxic ecosystem for extremist groups to gain followers among everyday people who would have previously denounced them. The pandemic has been a fertile ground for them to grow, gain a national audience and promote extreme action, which cult cult culminated on January 6th with the seizing of the US Capitol. So one particular concern is what some have termed a race war. These extremist groups look at projections of around two decades from now when white people in this country will no longer make up the majority. It's not a culture war, but a war of white aggression that is not just targeted at people of color, but against democracy itself. The recent more than 230 legislative bills introduced by Republicans in states across the country are designed to suppress and deny voting of people of color. We've seen a tremendous growth in this extremism in groups who deny factual evidence of fair elections and who are becoming more and more insular with their own sense of belonging and a narrative of white Americans versus all others. However, a word of caution, lest we think that the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris put an end to this, we need only to look at how many Republican off officials and voters still believe the election was stolen. What was only recently seen as a publicly unacceptable has now become commonplace and dominates the Republican party, posing not only a threat to black, brown and indigenous groups and people of color, but to, to democracy itself. Many moderate Republicans feel they can no longer have a home in the Republican party. So the white supremacist system is crashing down under the weight of this, its own oppression. There are many forces trying to prop it up. We must name white supremacy and racism and confront the attitudes, the systems and institutions and the use of violence that perpetuate it. We will not heal as a society until we acknowledge and reckon with this troubling and painful reality. As a white American, I have to ask myself, 
if those with my identity support white supremacy and uphold the white systems of white supremacy. Again, Ibram X. Kendi says that being race neutral is not possible in this country. Either you are supporting systems of racism or anti-racist work or, and are working against that, those forces. So let's pause for a minute and think about the impact of this and the social turmoil we're in. This is devastating and troubling, clearly. Where do we go from here? What's the path forward? How do we create a society where racial equity, access, human rights, inclusion, peace with justice, democracy, full employment, and racial justice are commonplace? As troubling as this scenario is, there is a path forward. We at the Social Justice Institute are committed to face these challenges and bring our own university together to forge a path forward that puts, on, puts us on the side of racial justice and racial equity. The work takes place at multiple levels, as you can see in this slide. At the individual level, there's much that we can do, beginning with educating ourselves, through racial equity training and bystanders training, we can take uh, an inventory of our own beliefs and attitudes and behaviors. At the relationship level, there are many paths for working toward racial justice, beginning with what Brian Stevenson calls getting proximate. We must break out of our siloed existence and encounter others who are not like us. We can form what Professor Mark Joseph calls racial equity buddies who can provide support for us on our racial equity journey and help hold us accountable. I dare say we must also seek out those who might have written, we might have written off as the enemy of racial justice. Rather than denounce those who are drawn toward these extremist views and that we see as racist, we need to see their humanity too and understand their journey and what motivates them. Ultimately, I'm, I believe we must never waver in our commitment to justice, but also accept people as human, see them as whole and not needing fixing. This is the true call of nonviolence. Let's jump to the highest level for a moment where we all want to see social change. This is where conducting research can reveal the patterns I've described today and begin to identify root causes Designing and evaluating effective interventions can lead to new policies and practices to break systemic injustices. This is work we are engaged in across the university. Today, however, I want to focus on the remainder of our time on the institutional level. From a systems change perspective, this is where we can make change, starting where we have the most influence and control. And that's where Case Western Reserve University sits. So the Social Justice Institute, beginning last May when Aisha and I assumed our leadership roles, has been working closely with the university to respond to the call for racial justice sweeping our community and our country. We issued a call to action that started by calling on CWRU to acknowledge our complicity in institutional racism and reflect on our own behaviors and patterns and our biases and publicly commit to work for institutional change. Among other things, we committed to take steps to challenge white supremacy in our culture and create an anti-racist agenda. Our university was quick to respond. So on June 10th, the university held a day of dialogue. In that day of dialogue, there were 11 sessions held university-wide throughout the entire day. Co-director Hardaway facilitated a dialogue with CWRU police chief Jay Hodge and other officers. I led a faculty staff dialogue to examine institutional racism at CWRU. We had over 140 participants, faculty and staff in that session, and we had 14 facilitated breakout sessions who all took notes and prepared, uh, uh, analyzed the data and, and presented a report to the university. In response, a group of students who had participated in that came together through a coalition of groups and created what they called Standing in Solidarity with Black Members of CWRU in Cleveland. It was bold and well-crafted statement 
demanding action and stirred the university to act. There were four major demands. Changes to the CWRU police department and security presence, changes in the relationship between CWRU and the surrounding Cleveland community, changes in faculty representation, and changes that would enhance the Black experience on campus. CWRU fortunately responded. And in so doing, I won't read all of these things, but based on that day of dialogue, the very next day, um, a student-led task force for a better uh, CWRU was beginning uh, to, to take shape. That task force began and it engaged 192 students who elected to serve um, and became part of seven working groups. And Professor Hardaway serves on, the, on that committee. In September, we held another full day of dialogue. And then since then, there have been a series of proposals to an executive board with student feedback and just recently at the end of March, those final proposals were submitted to the executive committee for action. So let me say, uh, in addition to a task force, the university has moved quickly and there's action at all eight schools, but I wanna give uh, some sample of the university wide uh, responses before I turn it over to Aisha. The president and provost charged the deans to make hiring of underrepresented minority faculty a priority the university hired Dr. Heather Burton as Senior Director for Faculty and Institutional Diversity. All faculty hiring committees, staff hiring committees, and hiring managers are now required to go through inter interrupting bias training and uh, diversity 360 training and pursue best practices for yielding diverse applicant pools. And each dean has appointed a diversity liaison to partner with the Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equal Opportunity to work collaboratively uh, across campus. And those uh, teams are working now. The president and provost authorized a proposal to the Higher Learning Commission, that's our accrediting body, to focus this year's initiative on diversity as our quality initiative. And I sit on that committee. CWRU has added 41 courses and counting across the entire curriculum that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the public safety uh, uh, at, at Case Western is working with campus partners to address community concerns. Again, looking at hiring and, uh, and, and the process for in interrupting bias. And the university is in talks with Little Italy and addressing the biases that are often created there. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Aisha and she is going to talk to us about the Social Justice Institute. Thank you so much. So at SJI, we define social justice as the process by which we work to eradicate systems of oppression. But the purpose of the work is to advance fairness and equity through the re redistribution and expansion of resources and opportunities while exalting human dignity and respect. There are four basic tenets of what we believe in that drive our, our social justice work. You can go to the next slide, Mark. They include first access, um, seeking greater equality of access in goods and services. Uh, the second is equity, instituting policies and processes to overcome unfairness caused by unequal access to economic resources and power. The third is participation, expanding opportunities for true actual participation in the decisions that govern the lives of the marginalized. And finally, human rights, securing equal rights in the legal, industrial, and political arenas. The work that we do, though, um, the work that we do is enhanced uh, through our support of research and learning on campus. We provide grants through the Social Justice Fellowship Program to postgraduates and faculty members engaged in work that advance social justice. Previous grants have supported proposals that focus on local and global issues. Uh, the projects that we fund are as diverse as their recipients. We also coordinate and offer an inter interdisciplinary undergraduate social justice minor on campus. Uh, students are prepared to address local and national uh, as well as global inequities through engaging in a curriculum that centers on the history, 
theory and practice of social justice, as well as understanding the distribution of power and resources, opportunities, and so much more. A highlight of our year, our first year uh, as co-directors, has been um, our SJI's 10th anniversary celebration that was held from October 23rd through 24th. We were honored with the return of founding director, Dr. Rhonda Y. Williams to our campus. And we experienced an amazing performance from her entitled Breathe, Resist, Live. Um, the Saturday sessions included six workshops by our faculty members from across campus, as well as local scholars on topics such as racism, mass incarceration, immigration and human rights, all of which have been central to SJI over the past 10 years. And so thinking about SJI moving forward, uh, Mark and I, um, as I hope you all have heard tonight, are really excited about the opportunity to work together. We truly believe that our skill sets um, and our interests uh, create a strong synergy and complement each other uh, in a meaningful and hopefully impactful way. And so when we were in view, um, um, so we were invited by the university to bring our own scholarship and community practices to SJI. And under our leadership, we are committed to first, actively work to ensure that police services on our campus align with our community standards in a way that make all people feel safe and welcome on campus. This includes asking difficult questions about police culture, leadership, funding, and the sheer number of agencies with authority and access to our community. We also um, intend and are committed to conduct, leaders, uh, conduct research designed to understand disparities within the criminal system on a local, state, and national level, with the ultimate goal being to provide support for clear policy recommendations that identify and end um, inequities. We also uh, intend to create small, uh, strong partnerships locally and across the country designed to secure the liberation of the marginalized and, and oppressed. There are other institutes uh, or organizations like SJI uh, or that do some component of the work of SJI, like SJI, and we intend to create strong partnerships with them uh, while also strengthening our relationships here um, in our community. And finally, we wanna work with the, CR, the CWRU development experts to find and secure funding to stabilize SJI and ensure not only its presence on our campus that I think is so critical, but most importantly also to um, make sure that it has access to the critical resources necessary to do this work in a meaningful and impactful way. Thank you. Let me say just a little bit about uh, one of the goals that the uh, students standing in solidarity proposal uh, requ uh, re demanded, and that is changing the relationship between the university and the surrounding community. So the work that I bring from uh, the Community Innovation Network is really around this area of really uh, redefining um, and moving toward authentic university community engagement. So that's a two-way process where the, the resources and knowledge and skills in the academy are shared in the community and the best practices and the community scholarship and the indigenous wisdom in our communities is brought back into the university. So that's a two-way process. And in um, the Power of Diversity lecture uh, last semester, I shared uh, the spotlight with um, uh, Gwendolyn Garth, a community scholar who we work with regularly. And we developed these seven steps for community building, which is really about getting proximate and acknowledging the injustice and working towards healing as we lift up the assets and share power for, for transforming this relationship. I won't go into the details of this now. There, there's a linear process that if you wanna see that, what that looks like, but we believe that we have to simultaneously build trusting relationships and address, address the racial injustices and inequities that exist between uh, the university and our adjoining neighborhoods. The way we, we practice this is a, is a flagship program supported by the provost at the university called Foundations of Community Building. And this is a program that's eight months long and it uses strength-based approaches to change. And what we've been able to see in the two cohorts that have gone through this, faculty and staff from the university 
neighborhood residents and community-based organizations uh, joining together and building these powerful trusting relationships and building bridges and working on action steps. And one of the action steps from the first cohort President Cowan mentioned, and it's the last point on the outcomes here, and that is the formation of the first Neighborhood Advisory Council at CWRU, a formal body that now is recognized by the university as a voice of the residents uh, on our campus. So we wanna end with a call to action and then we'll leave time for questions and answers. We believe that it's important for all of us to educate ourselves, to do the work, I've mentioned a number of scholars today. There are incredible resources available um, that, that we should all be reading and learning about. We should individually commit to our own transformation, whether it be racial equity and inclusion training or bystander training and, uh, and doing the work ourselves in that individual level. We encourage you to join our Social Justice Institute in our events. Uh, we have an event coming up soon. Um, in fact, it's this Saturday night where Frida Berrigan will be sharing about, um, are we heeding Dr. King's words in that speech from uh, 54 years ago about Vietnam, where he talked about the triad of racism, militarism, and excessive materialism. We also feel it's very important for everyone to be working as an ally with Black, Indigenous, and people of color uh, in, in the movement. And, um, and, and if you are white like me, find a way to be supportive and to work at allyship by following the lead of people of color and not, not getting in the way or taking uh, the spotlight away from them. And uh, at an organizational level, we would encourage you, all of you to change, uh, to create a change team at your organization, your institution, your community to start working at this uh, systems change. And then finally, we encourage you to support the sustainability of the Social Justice Institute as uh, we give out grants to uh, graduates and, and, and um, faculty, as well as community partners for, the, for advancing this work. And with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And we thank you for the time and we have some time for a few questions. Well, excellent. Uh, Mark, Ayusha, I wanna thank you both for your presentation. And we do have some questions and I wanna remind everybody that if you have a question, um, you can send that into uh, via email, faculty-spotlight at case.edu. And we do have a few that have come in already. And there are a couple of them, uh, Mark, these are somewhat related. So I'm gonna start with these. Um, one from Stacy, one from Patty. Um, Stacy asks, at what, which intersections of your identity do you exercise privilege and at which intersections do you rely most upon allies? And then Patty's asking, you know, how do you suggest responding to someone who says their ancestors never owned slaves and they would never own slaves and they don't see race as an issue or a problem? Yeah, I can, I can start with that and I, I welcome your contribution as well, Professor Hardaway. I, I, I believe that uh, the work that we have to do in this country uh, as white Americans is immense. And it doesn't really matter the direct role that we had in the enslavement of, of Africans in this country. We all uh, have uh, both benefited and suffered from white supremacy and from these systems of oppression. And it's all of our responsibility to take a stance. There is no such thing as being race neutral. So I think that is an important piece of the, uh, of the component that we have to, to recognize. And in doing that work, increasingly reading about white fragility uh, was, a, was a big turning point in my own life, learning that I need to stop focusing on me and support people of color in their struggle and get over some of my own defensiveness and reactions. And so I think, I think that's the inner work that we need to do. So, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Professor Hardaway add to this. Yeah, I um, thank you so much uh, for allowing me to, to give a little bit of voice to this. I think uh, um, that question is interesting. The first thing I wanna say is that I recognize fully that in my role as a faculty member uh, and, and as a researcher, and somebody who gets to um, dig into things that matter to me uh, with the support of an institution like Case Western Reserve University. Uh, I, 
operate at many times throughout the day from a place of privilege. I acknowledge that, I understand that, um, and is why I think it's so critically important for us to stay connected uh, to the spaces and places that we're working for, for and, 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 and in connection with so that we don't lose sight of what's really at stake um, and the interest in the voice of those um, uh, that we're working with. Um, that's the first thing. The second question as it relates to um, um, the last part that I heard, um, Eric, was the fact that the, the, the questioner doesn't believe that race is a problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so they said their ancestors never owned slaves and they would never own slaves and they don't see race as an issue or a problem. Yeah. So she's that looking for some, some guidance or clarity on how to respond to someone who, says um, that. who, who has that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that uh, the first thing I would say is that there is plenty of research out there that demonstrates that that race is a problem. That even as I sit here and acknowledge to you that I'm operating from a place of privilege by being a, a faculty member at an institution, I think it's also important for us to know that that is not the truth for uh, the majority of, uh, of black and brown people in this country. And that even when education, if we looked at education, I was told a long time ago that it's supposed to be the great equalizer, uh, that it in fact is not the great equalizer. That black women who have uh, more degrees than the, the, mo the majority of other, any other racial group or sex uh, or gender, um, uh, still nonetheless uh, make less uh, than their counterparts uh, and, and make less obviously uh, um, than white men. So, so there are disparities that exist and I would encourage someone, I think Mark mentioned, uh, mentioned REI training. Um, the groundwater training is a really, really good uh, exploration into the understanding deeply the impact of race in America, even if you want to devoid uh, slavery from, remove slavery from that equation, um, the color of a person's skin does determine what they have access to um, and what they're able to, to achieve. Um, and then, and, yeah, and, 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 and the point about owning or not owning slaves, um, um, I think I'll leave that for another conversation. <laughs> I, I would just add to that last question. Uh, I could have said that. Uh, my, my family, my, my ancestors did not own slaves. They were poor and working class white uh, families. But uh, that's why I shared the story I did because I still benefited from this system and, and we have to own how this privilege has, has uh, benefited folks. So, so that's partly why I feel it's important for me to tell my story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just think that the the the, the connection, the, the reality of the situation is, is if we try to say that because you know you didn't own slaves, that that means that racism isn't a problem. The 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 connection between those two thoughts in and of themselves are extremely prob it's extremely problematic. Um and it and it really does demonstrate how in fact um it conti race continues to be a, a, an issue or a problem. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the, no, another question that came through is, um, and this I think relates back to one of the ideas that you said, Professor Hardaway. You know, some of the work that you do at SJI is asking difficult questions about police culture. And so the question is, that came up is, you know, what role do you see police playing in ensuring a safe community? Hmm. How does that how does that link up with your work? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think we need to do a better job of imagining what public safety looks like in our country. Um, I hope this isn't controversial to say, uh, police are not equipped to do everything that they've been asked to do. Uh, the reality of the situation is, is that the majority of police calls in, in most cities, major or otherwise across the United States, involve conduct that's not violent in nature uh, and doesn't require right, someone to show up with a service weapon uh, and the authority to use deadly force. Uh, we have got to find a way, and I, I don't think it's, quite honestly, I don't think it's the job of the police to figure it out. We have elected and appointed officials 
who are um, authorized and entrusted with um, this, this responsibility of figuring out how to do this. And so I, I, I think that our elected and appointed officials have got to start being mindful of what we're asking police to do um, and um, living up to their, their obligations to ensure that all communities, all individuals within their, their, their cities or their states uh, are in fact policed equally, are policed in the same way. It should not be that Mark is policed differently than I'm policed. Mm -hmm. If the solution to police um, misconduct is, right, that, that black and brown people just need to be policed the same way that white people are, um, we might want to start there. Mm -hmm. I, I would just add to that, and, and, and this is no surprise to um, Chief Hodge or our Public Safety Director, Frank Deems, that, uh, and they would agree with this, I, I believe, and that is that in my work with, in community development and restorative justice, I, we recognize, and the research bears this out, that safety is not achieved by law enforcement alone. It, we can't rely on law, law enforcement to, to achieve safety. They're one of the partners and one of the players in this. And so one of the real problems structurally with universities is they are these contained campuses where there is this notion of protecting those within it from those without. And so we have to reimagine that notion. So that's why it's so important that we build these relationships and build trust because we actually have to work together as a broader community. It's not about the case bubble, it's about bursting that bubble and about creating a community that is university and neighborhood together, where all are welcome and all are working to ensure that everyone is included, feels valued and feels safe. And, and the police can play a role in that, but we can't, uh, we can't uh, re resort to law enforcement and perimeter policing as a strategy by itself to, to create safety. Absolutely. Well, I know we're, we're getting close to our time and I want to be respectful of everyone. I'm grateful for your time and uh, respectful of our audience's time. You know, I wanted to ask one final question and then, but I want to, before I do that, I want to see if there are any, um, any final thoughts that you have that you'd like to share. No. All right. So my final question is if folks are interested in joining you in your call to action and getting involved with the work of SJI, how do they find you and how can they get in contact with you? That's easy. Um, social justice at case.edu uh, is an easy way to get in contact with us. We both also have faculty web pages at our respective schools, the law school and um, the Mandale School of Applied Social uh, Sciences. Uh, I think that those two ways, either through our, pers our, our professional emails at case, aisha.hardaway at case.edu and mark.chup at case.edu or social justice at case.edu. Um, this is the easiest ways to find us. And, and I would encourage everyone to, to, to sign up for our newsletter. We do a lot of work with our partners. And so the, the event this Saturday is with a number of partners, the Cleveland Nonviolence Network, IRTF, the, our teach-in was with a number of partners. So there's, there's a whole host of networks that you become part of by joining uh, our newsletter. And so we, and, and we send out uh, information and almost everything we do is is completely free so there's lots of ways for people to access it well that's fantastic i'm so thankful for both of you for your time for the work that you lead on our campus and in our broader community you're making change and i look forward to what you accomplish next and i'm so thankful for your time this evening i want to thank everyone who joined us tonight for being part of this program and I want to invite you to join us again. Um, we have an upcoming program. It's the Think Forum, the F. Joseph Callahan Lecture. And this one will be featuring compassion researcher um, and a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He's a professor uh, of psychology. His name is Decker Keltner. And he'll be joining us on April 29th at five o'clock. And his topic will be 21st century power, principles, practices, and positive social change. So I hope that you will join us um for that conversation as well it will be free and open to the public and you can find that on our website um, for the think forum lecture so thank you for joining us for tonight's faculty spotlight thank you professor chop and professor hardaway everyone enjoy your evening thank you <laughs>